What's up everybody, out here at the track, just finished up an acceleration workout, and today I ran three tenths of a second faster to 30 meters than I did yesterday, and today we're gonna to talk about why. Leading up to this weekend, I had a fairly tough week of training last week, a pretty tough week prior to that. This week I did 30s and 40s on Monday, came out on Wednesday and did a 300 meter test where I ran 36.2. I haven't run a all out 300 meter in like eight years, so I was pretty happy with that. I think it's a good place to start. I could probably chop at least a second or two off of that, so it'll be interesting to see how that changes over time. After that, I went to the gym and did some heavy box squats up to 465, some single leg hip thrusts, double leg hip thrusts, pogo hops, things like that. Then I took a couple days off due to the holiday and some social obligations I had to tend to. So after taking a couple days off, I went to the track yesterday, which is Saturday, and it was early in the morning, it was cold out, and I just didn't feel very good, you know? And typically when I take two days off in a row or longer, when I come back, I tend to run quite slow. And this is the type of information that if you're a self-coached athlete or you're coaching athletes, you need to take into consideration because some athletes do really well coming off of a complete rest break. Other people, other athletes need some form of, you know, nervous system stimulation in their program for them to be able to feel well when they're on the track. And I'm that type of athlete. If I do too much volume, then I get crushed and I can't run fast. If I do nothing, then I'm flat and I don't feel like I have any force production, frequency or anything like that. So for me to perform well, I have to find a nice middle ground of enough work to get my system going, get myself revved up, sort of like warming up your car, but not do so much to where I'm fatigued and not able to perform or I have aches and pains or things like that. So the training load, exercise selection, all of these things play a role in whether or not you can find a good combination of work to rest that allows you to perform your best. Now real quick, if you want high quality training sent to your phone each week and access to my Discord server, check out my online training group, which is linked below. So after yesterday's sprint session where I did a mix of 10s, 20s, and 30s, they were not very fast at all. Then I went to the gym, I did step ups up to 445 pounds, did some prowler sprints as a warm up, did some jump squats as a way to sort of check where I was at that day because if you regularly test the same exercise, you can look at things like time to peak velocity, mean propulsive velocity, peak velocity, whatever your metric of choice is, you can track that over time and see, okay, if I come into the gym and all of a sudden my jump squats with the same bar are far off from what I normally do, that's a day where I need to pull back, not load the body very much, and let myself recover. Whereas if you look at that exercise and you see, oh wow, you're jumping through the roof or you're getting off the ground really quickly, then that's a sign that you're in good shape and you can probably load a bit more that day as long as the rest of your week is, you know, it's appropriate for that to happen. I also did some semi-straight leg hip thrusts. I did bent leg calf extension on the leg press, which by the way, if you don't have a seated calf raise, doing a, a bent leg Calf extension on the leg press is a great way to work the soleus, work the gastroc, and work on that bent leg calf strength. So after the workout, I went home, I was pretty tired. I got a good amount of sleep last night, and I woke up feeling pretty good. I checked myself on the Omega Wave, and it was looking okay, nothing too spectacular, but it, I could tell that my system wasn't completely depleted from yesterday, and I actually felt a little bit more awake than I did yesterday when I went out to train. So I decided to come out to the track, my hamstring, which I think I have a little bit of tendonitis going on, it wasn't bothering me today. And so between the fact that I felt good from a nervous system perspective and I didn't really have any major aches and pains in my body, I thought, eh, let's go out to the track, I'll do a warm up. If I feel good, I'll do some accelerations. If I don't feel good, I'll do some tempo. So I gave myself some options of how I could train today depending on what state of readiness I was in. So I came to the track, I warmed up, I felt pretty good. I started with some pop outs out of a three point stance. I filmed myself from the side so I could look in between the reps on what I could improve on from a technique standpoint. And coming into this session, I had told myself, you need to work more on extending the hip, not by thinking about extending the hip, but just focusing on pushing as aggressively as you can. Lately, I've tended to rush my early acceleration and not fully extend at the hip. And that's been cutting down my ability to get to 10 and 20 at speeds that I know I'm capable of. So today I really wanted to focus on getting good hip extension, really launching and pushing well out of the blocks. And that's what I attempted to do. So I looked at the video, I saw, okay, it looks pretty good. I feel like I'm ready to go. So I did a 10 meter sprint out of blocks. I ran 182, which is pretty good for me. Not a PR, but you know, it's a, almost within a 10th of my PR. So that's pretty good. Then I set the cones out at 20 and 30 and decided to run some slightly longer accelerations. So then I ran a 20 meter and I ran 288, which my best ever, I believe is 287, maybe 283. So to run 288 after a pretty loaded day of training yesterday, that was a really good sign to me. So I thought, eh, I still feel good. Let's do a couple more. 
I ran one that was okay. I had a sort of a misstep early in the sprint that messed everything up. But then for that third rep, I came back and I ran 290 to 20 meters and 395 to 30 meters. So that's basically three tenths of a second faster than I ran yesterday. Why? Because I'm in a better state of readiness from a nervous system perspective. As sprinters, we have to prioritize our nervous system. When we're in the gym, if all we're thinking about is building muscle or what adaptations happen to the muscle in the gym, then we're going to be missing out because what we need to do in the gym, once we've built up the muscle and everything, you know, built a good base of strength, we need to use the gym, which is something we talked about in that Rolf interview that I posted. We need to use the gym to wire our nervous system to produce force within shorter time constraints. So when I did those step ups yesterday, I was hitting time to peak velocity ranging from maybe 0.18 to mid 0.2s. And that's with, you know, 400 some odd pounds on my back. So that's pretty good time to peak velocity. We're trying to wire the nervous system to produce force early in the movement. Then when we come out to the track, if we're not focusing on wh what state our nervous system is in, whether that's a result of how you sleep, the stress that's going on in your life, the training you've been doing, how you're stacking training together, or on the flip side, taking multiple days off and then your nervous system going into hibernation mode, you know, if you're not paying attention to that, you're gonna have a tough time being able to predict what days you're able to run fast or not. If over time you're able to track how well your nervous system is adapting to training or how well it's handling the training load that you're doing, whether that's in the form of a, you know, finger tap test on a little app on your phone, the Omega Wave, just simply taking a training log and looking at what I did in training and how I felt that day or the next day, you know, looking at times, looking at ground contact times in, in the My Jump app, looking at time to peak velocity on the VMAX Pro or the Move Factor X or whatever bar velocity tracking system you have. Any data that you can take, which some of it's really cheap, you know, you can film yourself sprinting and use a free app on your computer, Canovia, to time yourself. As long as you put in some work to track what your nervous system is doing and how it's handling your training, you can start to set up your training in a way that emphasizes allowing your nervous system to be in a good state of readiness when you come out to train. So how is that relevant to what we did today? Well, when I came out yesterday and sprinted, I was coming off two days of complete rest and some pretty hard training prior to that. So my nervous system was in hibernation mode. There was nothing going on with my nervous system when I woke up and did that early morning sprint session. So I ran very slow, slower than I've run pretty much all year. And to me, I was like, man, this sucks, you know? It's just a little disheartening when you see yourself run slow, but I thought, eh, you know, chalk it up to the weather, the early morning and taking a couple days off. So I went to the gym, I did a good amount of work, probably more work than I could have done, but I didn't go overboard either. It was enough to make me fairly tired, but not be exhausted. And it was enough to stimulate my nervous system to the point where I could wake up today, be pretty revved up to go, and then come out and do a low volume sprint session and run pretty fast. Now, one of the things we have to consider is if you benefit from back-to-back -back training days using high intensity training, such as doing accelerations two days in a row, maybe some light flying sprints one day and then accelerations the next day, or vice versa, doing accelerations one day and flying sprints the next, if you're that type of athlete, then you need to make sure you're keeping your volumes of training within a certain range so you're not getting burnt out by doing these back-to-back -back days. If you took a normal volume of training that you are doing you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Monday, Thursday, Saturday, or something like that where it's more spread out, you might be able to get away with doing that volume for a couple sessions, but it's gonna creep up on you and eventually it's gonna you know, bite you in the rear end and you're gonna have some trouble. So as you go about looking at how does my nervous system, how does my body as a whole react to one day of hard training or one day of high intensity training and then a low intensity day? How do I come back that third day? How do I perform? Do I perform well? Do I perform better than when I have a day off or do I perform worse than when I have a day off? That can be informative to you as far as how you need to set up your training to perform your best. Or you come out, you do one session, you know, medium volume, and then you come back the next day for a medium or a low volume high intensity session and you run faster, then that's a sign that you're the type of athlete that needs some form of potentiation, some form of nervous system stimulation in your program for you to perform your best. And if you can track this over time and look at, okay, every time that I do the right amount of volume 
for two days in a row, I run faster on that second day, then that can help you set yourself up for success in competition because then you know, okay, when I come out and do my pre-meet, I need to do something that gets my nervous system going. That could be a couple short sprints, 10 to 20 meters. That could be some very you know explosive but low volume lifts in the gym. It could be pogo hops. Or you might find that, no, when I do back-to-back -back days, I'm crushed. So you're the type who needs a complete day off before a meet or just a very light pre-meet warm-up where you do some jogging, some mobility stuff, and then you go home and rest and get ready for your competition that way. There's no one right way to do it. Everybody's different. Everybody's going to respond to different forms of training in ways that are unique to them. But with that said, as athletes or as coaches, we have to track what we're doing in the gym, on the track, and we have to look at the data that we have available to us, whether that's with fancy measuring devices or a, a camera and a, a computer program. We have to look at what we're doing, see how we or our athletes are responding to that training. And if we are able to repeat something over time, like for example, today I did two sprint sessions back to back and a lifting session and I ran faster the second day. If you recall, maybe a month ago or a month and a half ago, I posted a video about running a sub 760 after I did flying sprints the previous day. So now here we have two examples of times where I ran faster on the second day of training after doing a high intensity session the day before. So if I go out and I repeat this experiment another you know dozen times and each time or 90% of the time, I'm seeing better results on that second day of training where I'm putting two lower volume high intensity days together then that's really informative to me and can help me plan better for my competition. Now I know if, if this is repeatable and it's something that continues to happen, then I know when I go into meets, I need to do something the day before. Nothing crazy, I don't need to go max out, I don't need to go run you know, 150 meters all out or anything like that, but I just need to do something to get my system going so that way the second day I'm revved up and ready to go, not falling asleep at the track because my nervous system is nowhere to be found. Hopefully this gives you guys some ideas of how maybe you can start tracking what you're doing, reflecting on it in a training journal, and seeing do I feel better when I have complete rest days, a low intensity day like a tempo workout or a body weight circuit workout, and then I come out to sprint, do I feel better when I do that? Or do I feel better when I do a low volume sprint session or a low volume lift or both, and then I come out to the track and sprint, do I feel better when I do that? And if we can identify the training setups that make us feel good and run fast, then that's, that's it, that's the secret, right? That's what we wanna know as coaches and athletes is how can we set ourselves up to run our fastest on the day of competition? Because it doesn't help you to run a PR on Wednesday when your meet is on Saturday. You, you only really, you know, obviously it's great to run a PR, that's fun. But we wanna do it in competition because that's when it's legit, that's when we know fully automatic timing, running against other people, the pressure's on. If we can perform then, then our job is done. So how do we get to that point? By doing exactly what I talked about in this video. Track what you're doing, look at the reactions that the body has to different setups for training, and if you can repeat that over time to where every time you do a certain pattern of training, you tend to run faster than when you do a different pattern of training, then you know at least at this point in time with this athlete or yourself, this is how I need to train. This is how I need to set up my training and sequence my training for me to run my fastest.